Ian, the concept of emergence has become an important part of both physical analysis of reality and even a theological analysis. How do you see emergence enriching our understanding of reality? Well, I think um, you have to start with the opposite of emergence because it's a reaction to reductionism, uh, which uh, assumes that you can explain what goes on at a higher level by what's going on at the lower level, and that the lower level determines the higher level. That well, that uh, psychology is just biology, and biology is just uh, chemistry. chemistry, and chemistry is just physics. And if you really know what everything's going going on down here, it determines the the whole shebang. Uh, and I I think uh, I think one many scientists use that approach very fruitfully. Molecular biology has been a very, very powerful tool and has explained a lot of things that are going on. There certainly are, if you want, bottom-up causes that affect what goes on higher. I think there's been an increasing realization, though, that you need to supplement that by what you might call top-down causality, that what goes on at the higher levels influences what goes on at the lower levels without violating the lower-level laws, but setting boundary conditions for them, setting patterns, uh, patterns at one level, you need, you need various levels of explanation. The, the concepts you use in talking about uh, human relationships, about human agency, uh, you can explain at different levels, and they're, they're related to each other, but I think the important thing is that there's been so much work done now on systems theories in which you have to look at a larger whole, and you, you can't explain it just in terms of the parts. You have to look at the whole uh, and the patterns in that whole and what's going on at a higher level. So, and then emergence, of course, uh, it really is, the, is a contradiction to reductionism because it says what emerges at higher levels uh, is not just reducible to or explainable by or determined by, because I think it's the causal relationships particularly, what goes on in the parts or at the lower level. The fascinating part of this is that the whole is only made up of the parts, but yet the whole itself has some new characteristics right. that you couldn't predict, maybe not even in theory, right. from the characteristics of all the parts put together. I think that's it. It's not only the parts, of course, but and everybody would, would recognize it's the organization of the parts but what some people are reluctant to go on to say is that the patterns of activity at, at one level uh, have their own integrity and their own interactions at that level. And uh, that one needs to look, one needs to look at both. I mean, you, you can't uh, avoid looking at the, at the parts. You can't avoid asking what, what are the molecules doing? Because in one sense, it's, it's true, there's nothing there but the molecules, but the molecules allow patterns of activity that are very different from what uh, one, the kinds, even, the, even the words you use, the theories you use, the, the kinds, of, uh, kinds of patterns of activity at different levels. Even though this type of analysis has absolutely nothing to do with theology, it seems that it is the kind of thinking that someone who believed in a theism would be more comfortable with. Sure, and it does have something to do with theology in the sense that uh, if, if you are stressing what's going down, on, down at the bottom, you're basically a materialist. You're, both, you're basically saying all there is is matter. Uh, and uh, the rest is, a, is an illusion, so to speak. And uh, it has to do with human freedom, because if everything's determined by the motion of the molecules, then freedom is, is illusory. So that it, I think it does have a lot to do with concepts of personhood. It also has to do with evolutionary history, the way that gradual, the gradual emergence in history, not, not just the emergence 
within any being at one time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of higher patterns of activity. It has to do with the relation of mind and body. Yeah, that you don't have to be a dualist and say you're suddenly adding on a mind, but you're saying there are kinds of mental phenomena, ideas have an influence. So it, it is a sense, a rebuttal of, uh, or a criticism of materialism, which says all there is is matter, and the only, all you need to explain anything is to find out what the matter is doing. And I think uh, you, can, you can say that, but it seems to me you don't, very few people would actually believe that you could predict a Mozart symphony from knowledge of the, the motion of the molecules in his past or even in his present. Well, what you're saying then is that uh, by having a theological belief, you can inform science in terms of maybe telling science how to view the phenomena, not what the phenomena are or how they operate together, but a theological understanding might help elucidate how to view that science. I think, I think one's got to be very careful not to say that the theologian should tell the scientist what his data is going to be. Sure. But I think it may be that a, a philosophical or a theological perspective may lead one to look for different kinds of evidence, may make one open to uh, other kinds of patterns of evidence. So I, I want to be very careful not to have the theologian. <laughs> There's enough past history of getting, getting it wrong. And, and I think it's mainly the theologian who's going to learn from the, from the scientist. But in, 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 in often by putting the scientific finding into a wide, wider context, by interpreting the evidence, by opening perhaps new doors of possibility as to what one will study, but not telling one what the conclusion from that study will be. So I think respecting the integrity of science is very important. But I think also realizing that science depends on assumptions, depends on, and materialism, even if one said uh, science can only study material phenomena, that doesn't necessarily mean that material phenomena are all that exist. But I think even within science, a kind of richer understanding of the kinds of things that are going on and the way they're related to each other can be important. And certainly the concept of emergence, whether it is uh, purely from a scientific view or informed to some degree by a philosophical or theological perspective, either way, is a critical uh, way of thinking about the entire natural world. I think it is, and it, it, it stresses the interdependence. Instead of studying each little thing by itself, which you need to do, the interdependence, uh, the, the way the context uh, affects, and that, that really, particularly when you come to human beings or to any organism, uh, that organism is a product of interacting with a wider environment in the organism, but then also the, the wider environment, and in the case of the human being, we're, we're social beings, language has formed us, and that's a cultural phenomenon. So who we are is a product not just of the way molecules are moving, but who we are depends on our interaction both within us and with an environment, and with a social environment, because I'm very much impressed with, with our being basically social beings and we become persons in that in environment. We, we, we learn a language through uh, uh, interaction with other people. And a child needs that. If, if a child doesn't learn language by a certain point in development, they'll never acquire it because that, that, that interaction. So we're embodied beings, we're social beings, we're beings in an environment. And I think that's sort of a holistic out out of, that doesn't rule out the importance of looking at every little detail, but that also recognizes that the patterns of human activity uh, involve many levels of interaction.